The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Anti-Asian hate crimes didn't begin with a pandemic, but they've gotten worse since. Tonight, we'll look into what's going on and why. Then our Ontario Hubs explain how some educators in the province are trying to help student athletes to stay in the game. And from this week's Ontario budget to why Canada needs more competition, we've got the Agenda's Week in Review. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. It's Friday, March 26th, and that's next on the Agenda. From verbal and physical attacks to blaming and shaming, hate crimes and racist slurs directed at people of Asian descent have been on the rise in this country since the pandemic began. But it's just highlighted a long-standing problem that advocates say must now finally be confronted. With us for more in Edmonton, Alberta, Gina Wong, registered psychologist and a professor at Athabasca University in Alberta. And here in Ontario's capital city, A.V. Go, clinic director of the Chinese and Southeast Asian Legal Clinic. Hello, welcome to you both. Hi, Nam. Hi. Thank you for having me. Thank you both for being here. Uh, before we start our discussion, I wanted to take a look at findings from a report that was compiled with data from incidents that were reported to the websites covidracism.ca and eliminate.org. Sheldon, could you please bring up the numbers for us? The report found that there have been 1,150 racist attacks across Canada against Asian people. 84% were against people of East Asian descent. 40% of these attacks took place place here in Ontario, 73% were verbal harassment, 11% involved physical contact, 10% involved coughing or spitting, which of course is even worse now during the pandemic when we're facing a virus that spreads through droplets. The majority of these attacks occurred in public spaces outside, and in second place, the incidents took place most in food sector locations like grocery stores and restaurants. AV, you know, when you you hear those numbers and you hear about some of these incidences that have happened to other people what go through what goes through your mind first of all uh, the report uh, was uh, compiled by our clinic along with the Chinese Canadian National Council for Social Justice and CCNC Toronto as well as project 1907 um, and we have been collecting these uh, data since uh, last year but I have to say that you know it doesn't surprise me um, because even before the pandemic was declared, uh, you know, we have been calling on uh, officials and, uh, and government representatives uh, to pay special attention to the possible rise of anti-Asian racism. Uh, as soon as the first case arrived in Canada, uh, we already start to see uh, incidents of hate uh, and racism online, as well as Chinese uh, restaurants and businesses being targeted. And that was back in January 2020. So, you know, nobody should be surprised by uh, the, the incident, but I think the number is still quite alarming, the fact that we have, you know, over 1,100 and 500 of those happened uh, this year uh, in 2021. Um, you know, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, I, I get a sense of frustration because this has been happening from the very beginning. Um, is that correct? Yes, for sure, it has been happening since uh, since January, and even back in January 2020, uh, there were over uh, 10,000 uh, parents who petitioned the York Region School Board, trying to convince the school board not to allow students uh, who recently came back from China uh, to attend school, even though at that time we only had like one case. And since then, of course, we know that most of the travel cases have nothing to do with China. Most of these cases come from U.S. and Europe. But still, Chinese Canadians and other East Asian Canadians are still being targeted and blamed for the virus. Dr. Wang? I just wanted to add, what's interesting about the figures is that the U.S. has reported 3,795 cases of reported hate and racism against Asian and Pacific Islanders. And when we look at the, the population, Canada has 17.7 .7 Asian Canadians, while the U.S. population has about 5.6. So Canada actually has three times the population 
of Asians. And so when we look at those statistics, it sounds like, you know, close to 4,000 is more than that. But when you look at the proportions, there is more inflated hate and racism against Canadians. Are you surprised? Um, I don't know. Shocked? Surprised? Uh, not. It's a, you know, a complexity of feelings and in, in some ways not, given, you know, what's happening and has happened with some of our elected officials. And in some ways, of course, that part of me that just can't believe this is happening um, is still quite shocked. What about you, Avi? Uh, well, I don't think anyone should be surprised. So uh, Canada has a very long history of anti-Asian uh, racism. Uh, you know, for instance, 67 years of legislated racism against Chinese in the form of uh, Chinese head tax and exclusion act. Um, and other Asian communities have also been uh, targeted by uh, racist policies in Canada. And we also had the experience from 2003 during the SARS uh, crisis. Uh, once again, during that time, Chinese Canadian community was blamed uh, for bringing SARS to Canada. I think what's happening this time is that partly because of social media, but also par partly because of the, the big declaration of the pandemic, um, you know, the, the, the level and the extent of hate and racism uh, is far worse than what we saw in 2003. Um, this might sound like a, a silly question, but when we talk about hate crimes, um, I think when we talk about specific groups, like if you talk about the Jewish community or the black community, we can identify what, um, what identifies as a hate crime. When it comes to the um, anti-Asian racism, how do you identify anti-Asian anti hate crimes? Dr. Wong? Well, there's a spectrum involved. So from incivility, so acts of being shunned, uh, racial slurs, you know, the way that people look at us or, or jump back when they, when they see us, those are all acts of racism. And to the other end of the continuum, which of course is the violence, the aggression, uh, the attacks, the murders. So there's a wide range of what qualifies as racist acts. Um, some people might say that being shunned isn't a hate crime. Um, Avi, you know, how, do, how would you identify anti-Asian hate crimes? So if we are talking about hate crimes in particular, uh, then I would say that any act of physical violence, and that involves, uh, would, that would include uh, coughing and spitting, which is motivated by hate as a result of uh, the, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the perpetrator's view about a certain group of people because of their race, that would, uh, that would qualify as a hate crime. So if someone spit at me because I'm Chinese, I would define that as a hate crime or hate motivated crime. And the police can, you know, in, in certain circumstances, uh, they can investigate the case uh, if they arrest a perpetrator, and if that person is convicted, the hate motivation can be formed part of the sentencing factor. Well, you mentioned the police. Uh, these numbers that we were talking about come from a community-created uh, system to report incidents of racism. Uh, but the police do ask people to call and report incidents as well, and they keep reports of hate crimes. Why was there a need for a separate reporting system? I think because most people would not even bother to call the police. Like, you know, I myself, I actually had experienced some of these, uh, you know, sort of incidents, and I never called the police. Like, you know, sort of it happened to me on broad daylight when I'm walking on the street. The guy spat at me and walked away. I mean, even if I called the police, what could the police have done, right? So, but at the same time, this, these kind of incidents have a tremendous impact and long-lasting impact of people who experience it. And the reason why we uh, created this website is to give voices to the victims who experience racism and at the same time really educate the Canadian public about the extent and nature of anti-Asian racism in Canada. Because I think all too often Canadians do not think that there is anti-Asian racism uh, and they do not have any understanding of the historical racism uh, towards Asian Canadians in Canada, notwithstanding you know, all the years of legislative racism that I mentioned earlier. Uh, do you think that that would make a difference if people understood uh, the history of um, Asians in Canada? It will make a difference in the sense that more people will become aware how serious the problem is. And if the public become more aware, then maybe the government will be more responsive. Because so far, I think that uh, 
you know, we, we're still waiting to see if the, the different levels of government will actually respond with concrete measures mm -hmm. or support for community groups. And, you know, we're just hoping uh, with more public education, it would lead to more action. Uh, Dr. Wong, I saw you. I, I, I want to come to you, but um, I just wanted to kind of touch on what something that A.V. said uh, about not maybe calling the police and not feeling that you can call the police. Um, that kind of, I think if anyone from the police is watching this, they might be uh, upset by that because I think their role is supposed to be to help people. How do we um, work on that trust, Dr. Wong? That really is the question. How do we do the work to make our systems, you know, culturally responsive and safe? It's something that I think we as a society will continue to work on throughout many, many, you know, decades and centuries. But, you know, when individuals have been hard pressed and traumatized by systems, it's, it's understandable that it's hard to go to the authorities. And I think, you know, every police service is different and what they offer, you know, hopefully would be the support. But, you know, it's up to each individual to know and to feel that trust. But until until the dialogue is there, until we can talk about the, you know, institutionalized and systemic oppression and racism, I think of all BIPOC individuals, that's when, you know, we can start looking at change and, and helping people to feel safe. Because, you know, this past year has been um, a year that's, left a lot of people uh, very stressed out. Um, and to think that you would go, you would find yourself in a situation where you're experiencing a hate crime and the people that are supposed to protect you, uh, who you're supposed to count on, you can't, you don't feel like you can call them to, um, you know, to have your back, so to speak. Uh, Av, do you find that maybe there are more people that this has happened to that maybe haven't reported it either on the websites that we mentioned or have gone to the police because of that? I have no doubt that uh, many people have never reported what happened to them, whether it's on our website or the, to the police. Uh, certainly, almost every single Chinese Canadian I know uh, over the last year has experienced uh, some incident. Uh, but I think I also agree with Dr. Wong that every police service is different. Uh, for instance, in Ontario, we know that the York Regional Police uh, seem to be more responsive uh, and be, have been very proactive mm -hmm. in in supporting the East Asian communities uh, in Markham uh, area and have been making, you know, a number of appropriate arrests. Uh, in contrast, the Toronto Police Services uh, has not, um, you know, been acts, uh, as uh, responsive. There have been some cases that happened in Toronto where the police did not initially uh, investigate as hate crime, and we don't know whether since then uh, they have pursued any further investigation. Uh, and Dr. Wang, you know, after 9-11, we saw um, a lot of people targeting individual Muslims uh, and blaming them for that incident. Um, as soon as the pandemic started, as we've been talking about, we saw people harassing individual Asian people. What is the psychology behind racism surfacing during times of social crisis? You know, racism is so attached to fear and feeling a lack of control. And, you know, I think all, no, none of us are immune to that. And, you know, in a way, it's trying to, you know, exert that, you know, this is outside of myself. This is, there's someone to blame. And, you know, I can sort of, you know, stand aside outside of it. And so, you know, trying to, to gain that control and hate is something I think cultivated in the homes that we live in. And so looking at the ways that we raise our children and looking at our society um, and how our government supports the you know various ethnicities and the ways that inclusive inclusivity diversity and equity are focused and centered on and Avi, yeah. you know um, I want to ask you about this because I when the news broke of what happened in Atlanta last week and six Asian women were killed uh, there was a lot of uh, disbelief um, how does American violence impact Canadian Asian communities I think that uh, well first of all anti-asian racism happens uh, in North America um, there there are a lot of the and, you know, historically, uh, many of the policies that Canada uh, introduced uh, on as it affects racialized groups uh, are 
you know, sort of uh, they follow the example of the Americans. So the Americans started the head tax and the exclusion act, and then we had our own version of head tax and the exclusion act. Uh, but also, I think, uh, you know, as Dr. Wong mentioned about uh, the, the levels of hate and racism in the state, no doubt that have also an impact on the, the, the psyche of uh, Canadians as well. And I think the general level of fear, um, you know, while I, I understand Dr. Wong talks about uh, the, the race, the race, act of racism is generated by fear, but we need to also uh, remember that uh, acts of racism also create fear among the victims. And right now, it, among the Asian Canadian community, many are really living in fear. Every time they step out of their home, they are afraid that they will be targeted again by some incident. Uh, we can, you know, we, our sense of security, our sense of dignity, and in some cases, our sense of the belonging is also under attack. So I think, I think we need to focus on how fear and racism have affected the victims and the communities, not just Asian communities, but other racialized groups, and then design uh, programs and actions and government uh, support uh, focusing on the victims. Well, you know, I, I think we mentioned social media a little bit at the beginning of the discussion, um, and we've seen politicians, most notably uh, the former President Trump, blaming China for the coronavirus pandemic. How does that influence Canadians, Dr. Wang? I think hearing racist tropes like the China virus and the Kung Fu virus from an elected official and leader like Trump makes a huge statement when, you know, I remember watching May of last year when he was talking to the reporter Jiang who asked him a question about why he was focusing on Canada or sorry, the United States having the best testing facilities. And he asked, he told her, ask China. And then he framed her question and why he responded that way, that it was a nasty question. And then he shut down the press conference. And I watched that as an Asian woman, watching how Jiang was silenced. And then he, you know, discontinued the whole press conference it was appalling. And it was silencing and it was modeling, you know, a stamp of approval, this normalization that you can ask China, blame China. And that type of rhetoric is so damaging and has had long standing and I think for, for even longer consequences on Asian individuals. There's been some people, A.V., that have, um, I guess, defended uh, the uh, President Trump's use of that phrase. Why is that inaccurate? Because they well, say that the virus originated in China. We don't know, and even assuming for a second that the virus originated in China, calling it Chinese virus or Wuhan virus um, has an impact on labeling and blaming the entire race. Um, so like, you know, the race of being like Chinese Canadians or Chinese Americans, uh, blaming us the individuals for the virus. Uh, and also I think that uh, the modeling of impact, it gives license to people who already harbor uh, racist views about Chinese Canadians to go about uh, doing the attacks that we've seen over the last year. And don't forget that we have our own version of blaming and shaming in Canada as well. Uh, one of our uh, MPs, uh, Derek Sloan, when he was running for the leadership race for the Conservative Party, he openly questioned the loyalty of Dr. Theresa Tam, calling her as, you know, working for China as opposed to Canada. And, you know, and like, these are all very inappropriate and I would argue racist uh, uh, comments as well. Do you think that it helped that he was kicked out of the party? Was that a, a stand? Well, he was kicked out not immediately. And I think for a number of days, the party was silent as to whether or not uh, they, you know, they endorse or not endorse his view. Uh, so, and eventually he was not kicked out because of this statement, uh, but because of other views that he expressed over time. You see a lot of, um, um, on social media, you know, there's a lot of conspiracy theories on YouTube. Uh, what roles do you think uh, social media plays, Dr. Wong, in all this? Social media basically is our conduit of information right now as we're all at home with the pandemic. And so there's a huge influence and, you know, fake news and all of that, you know, it's hard to tell and, you know, having some 
uh, you know, stances that media takes in terms of what they um, deliver, I think is really important. Our youth are so much on social media as we are, as I am. And so it's a purveyor and, you know, currently the way that we get our news and information. So it has a huge impact on the way that, um, you know, Asian uh, Canadians and Americans are uh, depicted and the ways, you know, media and television entertainment have been uh, stereotyping us, uh, you know, throughout time. Um, the vast majority of racist attacks are reported to be verbal harassment in public spaces, which I find so um, uh, fascinating in the sense that before, racism kind of used to be whispered, but in these incidences, it's in public spaces. Is there any way to actually prevent that from, ha from happening, A.V.? Mm. I think that's the $64 million question. How do we prevent racism? I think, uh, you know, it, 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 it really uh, requires a level of cooperation uh, between levels of government, as well as between government and community organizations. Certainly, there are many organizations doing uh, very good anti-racist work. Uh, you know, I think the government should support uh, what they're doing. We have to start thinking about how to educate our children and how to support children who are being uh, bullied and uh, uh, subject to racist uh, attacks that you know the report that you cited uh, today uh, you know we sh we know that uh, three particular groups are uh, more likely to be victims women uh, seniors and children uh, so I think we should think about how to protect uh, the vulnerable populations and people who are perceived, as uh, as easy targets uh, by the races, and but at the same time, I think in the long run we just need stronger anti-racist legislation and anti-racism program, both at the federal and provincial level, so that we can prevent these things from happening to anyone. Um, back when the SARS outbreak happened in 2003, Chinese restaurants began to lose a lot of business um, and people were scared they would catch SARS. Again, kind of the same things we're seeing now. Um, in response, then Prime Minister Jean Chrétien publicly had lunch at a Chinese restaurant in Chinatown to try to demonstrate that it was safe. Uh, Dr. Wong, do you think that that kind of strategy would work nowadays? Absolutely. Any collective action to demonstrate you know, that, that we are not, you know, the virus as people are, um, you know, donning that description of us. And so when we see um, elected officials and individuals being inclusive and celebrating and, you know, basic human, you know, kindness to us, I think it hugely demonstrates to individuals and, and the public that, you know, we are not different. We, not, we are not other. We belong here. And, you know, when calls to action from the federal government and provincially and, and they step in and they do these kinds of things to recognize what's happening for us, which is so essential, I think it makes a huge difference. Uh, most instances of anti-Asian crime have been uh, verbal attacks in public spaces like we were talking about. And it can be difficult for people to speak up in those uh, situations. Avi, what should someone do if they do witness something like that happening? So we have also started to think about doing more of these uh, bystander kind of training. Um, so, but of course, uh, the, the, the first uh, consideration is safety of the individuals. Uh, if it's safe for you to do so, then we are asking people to intervene. And intervening may not, does not mean necessarily that you're standing between the person being attacked and the attacker, but rather it could take a form of distraction calling for help, um, sort of calling out. Um, so like, you know, so it depends on the circumstances that you find yourself in uh, witnessing uh, something like this. Uh, as, if, as long as it's safe for you to do so, uh, we do encourage people to, uh, to speak out. And Dr. Wong, what, can, uh, what else can people do to help? I think it's so essential in addition to what Evie said, which is so important to step in and distract and do what you can but also it's so important to go up to the individual and say, I saw that, I see you, that was racist, that's not acceptable, are you okay? Because when we are seen and when someone says that, our, you know, psych psychologically we're co-regulated, we get that through someone else and to be seen is so important now. Visibility is, is you know, one of the issues 
that we face, the model minority, you know, we're seen to be polite and to behave well. So attention hasn't been on our issues. And so when you see an individual, be sure to make it known that you saw it um, and, you know, to stand with them. Otherwise, there's a sentiment that you're standing against them. And you have a, a campaign called the Gold Ribbon Campaign. What is that? Yes, I'm the proud ambassador of the Asian Gold Ribbon Campaign. And what that is, is a campaign to raise and continue sustained understanding about the psychological impact of the historical racism, as well as this current um, you know, swelling of anti-Asian hate and racism in North America and around the globe. We are in a state of emergency. This issue is very personal to me, and so um, you know, meaningful. My family has been affected. There's also that aspect of visibility with this campaign, and so you know, not staying quiet, as well. And additionally, with the intersectionality, also women and Canadians, we are polite. We are not supposed to ruffle feathers. And this campaign is about being seen and being heard, and to make waves. So to wear yellow ribbons on May 13th, um, to demonstrate and to reclaim the color yellow. You know, we were called the yellow peril in the 19th century. And so, you know, taking that yellow gold color, celebrating it, wearing it, to give us back that visibility. And lastly, I just want to say this campaign is going to involve youth. And, you know, we have tri-focus initiatives, a community outreach, celebration, visibility, and a fundraising component. We're just at the starting gate of this, and so we're welcoming uh, partners and allies. Uh, and please visit our social media. We will do that, uh, Dr. Wong and A.V. Go. Thank you so much for taking time to talk about this really um, important situation. We really appreciate your insights and understand you're very busy. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. School for most kids during this pandemic has meant few extracurriculars and very little sport. But two Ontario educators are trying to make sure that it's not a write-off year for young athletes, but instead a redshirt year. Mary Baxter covers the southwestern part of the province for Ontario Hubs, and she joins us now from London to explain. Welcome. Thanks, Jan. It's good to be here. So, Mary, what have students been missing out on without an opportunity to pursue athletics this year? Well, I spoke to one student, a grade nine student. His name is Owen Urquhart, and he loves sports like basketball and soccer and volleyball. And and normal in a normal school year, he'd be playing soccer and volleyball at school. And uh, he also is involved in uh, uh, playing basketball in the community. He's quite competitive in the community and is, has even been involved in a national program. But with COVID, all of that has basically been cancelled. And so for, for Owen to really work on his game, his his best resource is his driveway and, and the hoop there so he can shoot some hoops. Now, I want to talk about uh, the red shirt effect, which is the initiative that you wrote about for TVO.org. But I want to take a step back for the people who aren't familiar with sports. What exactly is uh, red shirting or a red shirt? So red shirt is a term that uh, has been applied mostly to post-secondary students who are involved in sports teams deciding to take a year off, you know, kind of like a sabbatical. Uh, and uh, during at some point during their they're playing with the team in in university. So so they'll go off. They might work on their game a little bit, uh, and then they uh, would come back and rejoin uh, the team in the next year. Now, the red shirt effect, this initiative was actually inspired by a now NBA player, but it was his journey from college to the pros that helped inspire this program. Tell us about that. That's right. Kelly Olenek is his name, uh, and he's a, a player with uh, a basketball player with Miami Heat, uh, and he's he's a Canadian. And during his, I think it was his third year, um, in, in his in his college years, he took that year as a red shirt year. He'd always been, you know, a good player. He was playing on the team, obviously, uh, but he never really stood out. And then he really, during that year off, he really worked on his game. He worked on becoming stronger and faster and even worked on sports psychology. And when he came back, well, he became a superstar. And I understand that these two educators, one in London and Thunder Bay, have sort of put together a virtual training program. How does it work and, and, and have, you know, has it been successful? 
Yeah. So, so what happened in uh, in in Ontario? Of course, as as I've mentioned, uh, things have been shut down for students and for a couple of educators. Uh, one is Michelle Lang. She is the uh, Thames Valley Regional Athletics Association coordinator, and her counterpart in Thunder Bay, Dave Pino. Uh, they they were experiencing so many challenges. They were trying. Michelle told me how much she was trying to figure out ways that students could get back and be active uh, during the school season, but every time time, you know, another wave of COVID came around and it would cancel plans. And so she and Dave kind of talked about it for for a while and, and, and they kind of figured out together that, hey, this is like a red shirt year. And, and they took us there in, in inspiration, Kelly Olenek, and they thought, why can't we do something online to to help students? So that's exactly what they did. They, they've developed programs, that they call it the red shirt effect, but the, the programs are slightly different uh, between the two areas because they're based more on their, their regional needs. So in uh, in uh, the London area case, for instance, um, what Michelle has done is to curate a series of videos and, and it, it's kind of like a video program that runs over eight weeks. And each week there's a number of different videos, videos that students can work with. They're done in real time they utilize local trainers uh, and, and top-notch local trainers to show the kids how to do the moves um, and as I mentioned they're in real time in Thunder Bay, uh, what Dave has done is to uh, develop a platform that coaches and uh, their their students can can use together. The coaches can provide students with different exercises or different activities. For instance, he's also uh, worked on developing ambassadors uh, for for the different sports, uh, including an Indigenous ambassador, uh, uh, a local a fitness trainer who is connecting with Indigenous students. Now, for your article, you spoke to both students and coaches. Uh, do we have an idea of how it's being received so far? I know it just launched earlier this year, so. Well, right now, I'm hearing a lot of enthusiasm, um, particularly from, from local phys ed teachers. Uh, one, one of the reasons being is that because of COVID, it's become very difficult to teach uh, physical education, especially when you know half of your class is at home and, and the way that uh, classes are being delivered has, has changed slightly uh, to, to help with uh, creating physical distancing. And uh, so... They're concerned about safety of kids, of course, when when they're working from home. The the video series that uh, Michelle developed uh, means that uh, the kids have access to you know a good series that can help them progress. It's at different levels. Uh, there's there's been some uh, concerns also though uh, about delivering um, online because there's that whole lack of ability to build team skills, of course, because you're you're working individually. But most experts that I I talked to mentioned, you know, that's given the extraordinary circumstances we're in, that's, that's, you know, understandable. Mary, I actually want to pull up a clip from one of the co-founders, David Pino, discussing the benefits of the program and potentially the future. Let's have a clip. Hey, you know what, you know, maybe we can engage students this way and then, oh my gosh, this opens up a whole door to students who, you know, maybe we haven't reached out to and, and done a good job of serving. So, uh, you know, I think, you know, in some respects, the hardship has, has forced us to, to look within and look for some creative ideas. And, and I'm really excited about not only what this project can mean in the short term, but now I think it gives an opportunity for us to uh, continue to serve more students. Um, but also once the season ends for a, for a particular student, it doesn't mean we don't, you know, we can, we have to cease having contact in terms of developing their, their skill set. All right, Mary, well, we heard from David Pinot talking about the future, potential future of this program. What do you see as the benefits of a program like this beyond the pandemic? I think Dave talks about one of one of the advantages, which is that uh, teams and their coaches can work past the season to to build skills. But another really valuable uh, uh, advantage of a program like this is that it will help to reach uh, underserved populations. So, for instance, there's lots of kids out there that are interested in a sport, but they they just they can't join a team for some reason. So, how do they learn how to to hone their skills for that sport or to find out more? So so that's what a program like this can do. Mary Baxter, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight on the show. That's Mary Baxter, Southwestern Ontario Hubs journalist.
The agenda this week examined how communities are trying to confront homelessness during the pandemic, assess the viability of the NDP's plan for a Green New Deal in the province, and considered what Canada's telecom sector could learn about competition. The agenda's week in review begins with our Ontario 2021 budget coverage. You've been very lucky this past year, borrowing you know money at 1.6 percent on average, which is just historically, <clears throat> excuse me, historically low rates. I note again that the budget papers say that if if interest rates go up even one point, that's another 750 million bucks that you're going to have to borrow, and rates are going to be higher going forward. Your budget documents say that too. So again, how how concerned should we be about your ability to eventually get us back to balance, which I know you want to do? without raising taxes or massive spending cuts? Well, interest rates have gone up, but we forecasted those rates to go up, and in the budget document, they're there, and they're still historically low, Steve. So we really do have the capacity, the fiscal capacity. What I'm really focused on is today. And we, are, we have a once-in-a-century type pandemic. Our job, it's like being uh, not finishing... Uh, storming the beaches and uh, and winning a war. I mean, we are against, uh, we have a war against invis invisible enemy. Um, we've got to get those vaccines. We want to put them in every arm that wants a vaccine, Steve. And I think that also the logistics and the infrastructure to go with that, that's why I announced the one billion. It doesn't end there, the contact, uh, the trace, uh, contact tracing, but the testing and the rapid testing so uh, that we can continually uh, invest in making sure that it's safe. And uh, I, I really think that uh, there, there's uh, that growth model will work in Ontario. But let me tell you one other thing that we don't really talk much about. Last week, I axed the fax. So the fax machines, uh, knowing government still has uh, fax machines. So ax the fax. And some people might say you still have fax machines. And that's exactly what I said when I came into government. So, uh, you know, that's, that's a machine like this. You got to put some paper in it. That's the way it works for those who are too young to remember. And we still have that. We can do things a lot smarter in this government. We've proven that we can modernize, that we can digitize, that we can cut red tape and do it all the, all the while while we're increasing funding. Because every time I save a dollar on a fax machine, we're putting it right back into health care and putting it right back into long-term care in other areas. I know you don't mean to suggest this, but, you know, the smart aleck in me wants to come back with this question anyway. You're not going to get rid of a $33 billion deficit by getting rid of fax machines, right? There's got to be more to it than... There's got to be a lot more to it than that. Well, absolutely, and, uh, you know, that's, that's true. It's very symbolic, and it's, it's in part to signal that we got to change the culture of government. So we have all these digital tools, and people want services and programs when they want it, where, where they want it. And so let me give you a couple examples. Our Ontario Small Business Grant Program, that's, that's already helped over 100 small, 100,000 small businesses in Ontario that we've given them a grant between ten dollars and $20,000. Many have told me that's the difference between keeping the lights on and turning them off. We did that all through one simple website. You can go one simple portal, uh, not a lot of people, just through a website. You could also apply for some of the other programs we already had. We made it simple and easy. Catherine Fife, you're the official opposition. We'll start with you. Initial reaction to something you just heard in Peter Bethlen Falvey's interview. Well, I mean, listen, I, I want to say right off the top that we were very uh, encouraged to see that there was some funding for vaccinations. Nobody in this province believes that the vaccination rollout is going well. Uh, businesses, healthcare professionals, uh, educators have said, listen, we need to get this right and it needs to we need to get you know needles in arms so one billion dollars hopefully this helps uh the race against uh, the variants is real and uh, we need to make sure that people are kept safe that said uh, we would have seen uh, some very strategic investment in keeping people safe uh, that, you know, that the minister just referenced. Uh, for many days now, many months, actually, we've been fighting for paid sick days. And listen, Steve, if people are still going to work 
a sick in Brampton and Peel and Mississauga and KW, uh, then, we were, then we're not going to get through this third wave. First of all, I think the whole budget is a swing and a miss because this was an opportunity to focus on the things that will set Ontarios up for a strong recovery. You know, we first have to deal with the crisis and the pandemic. I agree that the minister says that's the job right now. But once we have everyone vaccinated, we have to look at the economic recovery. And, and there are key priorities that Ontario families have. Investments in education, making sure we don't leave anyone behind, that we close those learning gaps that have occurred because students have been out for a year of disrupted learning. We also, um, you know, we know that women and racialized groups have been the hardest hit for the pandemic. And where is the specificity in this budget to address those concerns that are obvious? You know, so the missed opportunity is that we could have made a generational investment in childcare. We could have recognized cl the climate change crisis and made this a recovery that is a green recovery. There are so many aspects to this budget that uh, is just was very obvious. Yeah, I just think the government is blind to the reality Ontarians are facing. To think that they've cut $4.8 billion in the next fiscal year at a time when we're going into the third wave of uh, COVID, um, we're dealing with the fallout from the pandemic. Um, it appears to me that the finance minister left a few chapters of his budget at the printers. Uh, they mentioned the climate crisis twice, uh, homelessness twice. Uh, let's face it, uh, Steve, people need support to get through this pandemic, and they're going to need support for economic recovery. We know people need support for mental health. The government doesn't even meet its own annualized projected spending for that. They've cut public education by $790 million next year. Uh, they have not put in forward a plan for economic recovery that aligns with addressing the climate crisis. And finally, they're not um, addressing and putting the money we need to into things like supportive housing and other ways of addressing the housing affordability crisis across the province. Tony, start us off. How bad has COVID-19 been for your business? It's been absolutely catastrophic, not just business-wise, but personally. Um, what, what, what's happened for us is our numbers are so far down, it's, it's crazy. Uh, what's worse more than our numbers being down is what the Ontario government has done to really ruin the importance of being a hairstylist or a spa technician in Thunder Bay. Um, we are only four different businesses that are still closed in the gray zone. So many of my friends and I, we walk around and uh, think, you know, we're almost better off dead than we are alive. We're worth more dead than we are alive. Like the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. It's sad. Uh, my numbers are so far down. I'm down over $70,000 just in the first three months of this year. We've only been open for two weeks. Hmm. And what the government proposed today with the new budget of an additional ten to $20,000 doesn't even scrape the surface. It, it's not going to help us at all. That's not even close to what we were thinking was going to happen. Okay, Tony, thank you for setting the scene. We'll obviously follow up and, and find more details as we go along. Michael, how about you? What's your story? I can echo a lot of what Tony just said. I own Ottawa Special Events. We are an event rental company, so we rent stages and sound and lighting, pipe and drape, tables, chairs. And, you know, with the crushing numbers of public gatherings it's it's really hard for us to operate in 2020 we were down 97 percent which equates to over three million dollars and we unfortunately had to lay off our entire staff of 22 people last march and except for some piecemeal stuff here and there we haven't been able to bring anybody back yet if you're down 97 percent how are you even alive at all it's a great question you know we've uh, been able to negotiate with uh, some of the creditors along the way and at the same time, too, we've had the odd thing come in. Our, our landlord, at the time when landlords perhaps weren't being as favorable to small business as others, ours was incredible. Ours said they were right there with us. And so, you know, we've worked really hard to get the little amount of business to cover our operating costs. Gotcha. Ginger, how about you? What's COVID done to your two establishments? Well, uh, off the hook, I we purchased uh, March 9th of 2020. You're kidding. <laughs> No, so uh, it was devastating right off the hop for us. That graphic you threw up at the beginning is a, you know, a painful reminder of 
how much trouble we're actually in. And some of those permanently closed businesses were, are some of my friends, you know, in the business. And what was announced today is it's pathetic. The word is pathetic, eh? Yep. We didn't even get the grant that they were talking about it off the hook because um, we own the second business and we're considered an enterprise. So uh, we're only going to get support for one of our restaurants and not the other. It's like saying you have a house at a cottage and now you're a real estate mogul. Lorraine, start us off if you would. What has COVID-19 done to the homelessness issue that you were already dealing with? I think COVID has actually shone a light on the shadows where our governments and policies have tried to hit homeless people. Um, it's been clear during the pandemic that um, resources were hardly sufficient before the pandemic. And now this pandemic has really shown that these gaps have just been exacerbated. I think COVID comes at a time when the homelessness reality was in a state of emergency, as is the poison drug reality. So now we're living in this reality of like the triple threat of pandemics and people are literally dying just trying to to get housing somewhere. Nadine, do you notice that there is more homelessness and harder to serve homeless people because of this pandemic? Yes, there is. And because of the pandemic, I guess there's more help for the people. They put them up in hotels and everything like that. And you do you I, I guess you appreciate the fact that the governments have been prepared to do something on that. Yes, I am very much. But I presume there's going to be a time when putting up homeless people in hotels is no longer going to be an option. What then? That's why they need to come up with more tiny homes community, like what Ron Dell did, and that will help. Tell me what you mean when you say tiny homes. I heard you say that before, and I should have followed up then, but I'm going to follow up now. Well, at the at where I am at the lot 42, a better 10 city, it's a tiny home community with tiny homes. We have 20, 26 homes here at the moment. And what's a tiny home? It's an eight by 10. It's kind of like a shed, but it's a tiny home. And that is that is what we're doing here to house the homeless people. How many square feet would it be? Uh, it's about eight by 10. <laughs> so you're not kidding, it's tiny. And I live in one of them. Does it get the job done though? Yes, it does. It keeps you warm. It's just a safe place for you to be in. And you have your own key and it's like it's home. Okay. Uh, Reverend Dunn, how about you? Talk to us about whether or not COVID has made homelessness in southwestern Ontario look and feel different. Well, I'll, I'll echo, echo the statements made uh, out of Toronto. Um, what's happened is that I think all levels of government have they knew about homelessness, but now it's it's much more prevalent. There's a light been been shone on it, or the, the veil's been lifted, as it were. At one point um, during the first um, shutdown here in, in Windsor, Essex, we were the only kind of game in town in terms of you know it was like a little bit of a I was expecting tumbleweeds to go through past my window here. Um, people experiencing homelessness really had nowhere to go outside of of uh, a couple of, sh of shelters here locally. So um, I I think and I hope that. We've learned some things from this, that it doesn't go away when when we deem that the pandemic has been uh, tackled, and, and I hope that we'll be able to say that someday. Um, things like tiny homes, for example, in Kitchener-Waterloo, I think everyone's been looking at that project. Um, it takes political will. It takes um, government to say, okay, we know about zoning bylaws, but we're going we're gonna to help push these things through um, because they're necessary. We've been trying to build a new facility for the last couple of years. It's very difficult. And um, I think that this pandemic has has opened up the eyes of people who say, look, there's a lot more homelessness, either hidden or, or visual, than we first anticipated. I'm not going to assume that everybody has heard about it, so let's go through a bit of a point form here with some of the highlights of this plan. And Sheldon, I'll ask you if you would to bring the graphics up and let's go through it point by point. The NDP would propose to implement Ontario's first ever comprehensive zero emissions vehicles strategy and support the move to eliminate internal combustion engine vehicles by the year 2035. They would offer incentives to Ontarians who purchase these zero emissions vehicles. They would give $600 for households to install EV charging stations at homes, 
and require new homes to have vehicle charging capacity. They would retrofit existing buildings to be more energy efficient and ensure that all new buildings are as energy efficient as possible. The NDP says this would create 100,000 jobs over eight years as part of the retrofit program alone. They would electrify the GO train network along an accelerated timeline to replace dirty diesel trains along all lines. There would be no expansion of Ontario's nuclear capacity until cost and waste storage issues are resolved. The cost of all this, they estimate at $40 billion, and they would pay for it this way. They would reintroduce to Ontario a cap-and-trade program, which would bring in $30 billion a year, and then sell green bonds for the rest to the tune of $10 billion. That's the Green New Democratic deal, as outlined recently by Ontario's official opposition. Now, this is a, a very comprehensive plan. We've only put some of the highlights there. There's a lot more to it than that. Generally speaking, just before we go deep on this, um, Sarah, start us off here. General thoughts on what the NDP is trying to propose. It's a good climate plan. I mean, you know, we've been doing climate planning in globally now for a number of years. And, you know, the conversation has advanced significantly since we started talking about this, Steve, five years ago. It checks all the boxes. It deals with Ontario's major sources of emissions, which are buildings, transportation, heavy industry. It does, frankly, the level of effort that needs to get done. Bruce, your view. Uh, nonsense on stilts, as Jeremy, Jeremy Bentham once said. This is uh, describing the NDP's version of a socialist utopia that would actually be a nightmare. In a way, it's, I think, the NDP's um, attempt to transition us from a COVID emergency to a permanent climate emergency. Uh, it reads like it's been put together on the back of an envelope. It's not well costed. You know it's going to cost more than $40 billion. It's, um, it's a little crazy. Uh, I'm going to infer from that that you disagree with uh, Sarah. <laughs> just, just, just a tad. Just a tad. Gotcha. Okay, Angela, would you weigh in on this, please? I think it's a very strong climate plan. It calls for the phase out of Ontario's gas-fired power plants. Uh, in stark contrast to Doug Ford's plan of ramping up gas 500 percent, it calls for more wind and solar power. It calls for more water power imports from Quebec and more conservation. And uh, it's just taking us in a different direction than the existing uh, Ford government plan, which is more nuclear and gas and less renewables and conservation. You know, Robin, I do want to take advantage of the fact that you used to work for the Competition Bureau, and I want to get your sense of either how robust or not its efforts are in this country on behalf of consumers. What's yeah. the verdict on that? Well, I think that officers at the Competition Bureau and the commissioner of the Competition Bureau, um, you know, every day put in their best effort to try and protect and preserve competition in the country. I think a huge barrier that they face is our legislation. I think the efficiencies defense is uh, just one example of how there are, the, the Competition Bureau lacks the legislative tools it needs in order to protect competition. And uh, I think we're increasingly out of step with competition legislations in other countries. I mean, back to the efficiencies defense to kind of harp on this. Um, and another case of superior propane um, in um, sometime in uh, 2013, superior propane attempted to uh, acquire another company that dealt with uh, industrial chemicals. The deal was approved in Canada, but it was also reviewable in the United States. And when it was reviewed by the Federal Trade Commission in the US, it was challenged. And that just demonstrates um, how our law compares to the United States and how in a lot of ways it's stronger than what we have here. And that's actually not saying a whole lot because there is increasingly awareness by economic scholars in the U.S. that their competition approach is actually not as strong as it needs to be in order to promote competition. And um, the Washington Center for Equitable Growth has recently put together a database of about 150 economics papers. And a lot of these papers show empirical evidence that the lax competition 
enforcement approach of authorities in the U.S. has led to higher prices and less competition. Um, one paper that I find very compelling is a 2016 study that looks at mergers and acquisitions in the manufacturing sector. And the study shows that, in fact, most mergers lead to higher prices, which is uh, kind of mind boggling if you think that America has a system for preventing mergers that increase prices. And if we know that Canada's system, especially when it comes to mergers, is more lax than America's, then, I mean, for sure we have a problem. So I think, you know, the core issue here is Canada's legislation and um, the need to modernize it, especially in this new digital era where competition issues are becoming more and more complex. That's just some of what we covered this week on the agenda. For more, including the full conversations, you can visit our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. And that's it for this Friday, March 26, 2021. Next week, we'll assess the idea of vaccine passports, consider Canada's relationship with China, and we'll have another installment of our joint TVO Toronto Star initiative, The Democracy Agenda. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thank you for watching TVO and for joining us online at TVO.org. Have a great weekend, and Steve will see you on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. Ontario hubs are made possible by the Barry and Laurie Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman. And by viewers like you. Thank you.